Uh, we are so excited to be here tonight. Uh, not only do we have uh, the premiere of Room, which is probably one of the most endearing and special films of the award season, but also with us tonight is Brie Larson. Now, you will know Brie Larson in many, many different incarnations, I'm sure. Um, you may know that she grew up in, well, she was born in Sacramento, so we have a, we have a local connection, which is kind of great. Um, and she's been pretty prolific. She's, she's been, uh, I think she knew at a very early age that she was destined to be an actress, and we're so glad that she is. But you will know her from films like Short Term 12, or uh, Trainwreck, uh, 21 Jump Street, and uh, I'm sure that many of you uh, will remember her as uh, Toni Collette's uh, in endearingly, uh, let's say, rambunctious daughter um, in the United States of Tara, one of my personal favorites. <laughs> but for those of you who've read the book, Room, which I imagine is probably a few people here, right? You might wonder if a book like this is even filmable. It's a brilliant book, it's exquisitely conceived, and what it takes is brilliance in performance to match the book. And the performance you're about to see tonight is extraordinary and brilliant. And it gives us the opportunity to celebrate this great work and to thank Brie Larson. Please welcome Brie Larson. Okay. Am I to say something? No, you don't have to if you don't want to. Okay. I, <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for the applause. Um, I, and thank you for being here and taking the time to, to watch this film. I hope that um, you enjoy it. Would you, would you say that that's a proper word for this film? I think they can open their hearts to it. Mm, that's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> I, I encourage you to open your heart to this film and, um, and get really close to the person next to you. Feel comfortable holding their hand. I mean, I didn't mean that in a romantic way, but you might need it. Um, uh, enjoy. Thank you, Brie. We'll see you later. Well, what do you think? <laughs> I thought so. Zoe? So, we would like to honor and celebrate and thank this exceptional career-defining performance in which Brie Larson discovers her strong and lots, lots more. Uh, Brie Larson, you're a superhero. <laughs> and it's my great honor to give you the Mill Valley Film Festival. the Mill Valley Award. Thank you. It's so cool. It's a female body, isn't it? It is, without a head. She's a little flat-chested. Yes, I noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's really beautiful, and uh, there's a story behind that, too, and we can talk about that later. Okay. But uh, in the meantime, I just want to congratulate you 
for this amazing film and performance. Uh, there's not a false mo uh, note in your whole performance. And I always believed Ma every minute of this film. And when you think about the complexity of the character, when the character has been adopted, adopted, adopted. <laughs> What was that wine? I yeah, think. we did just have two glasses of wine. It was, so. uh, you were Bear assaulted. There wasn't a false moat, and <laughs> it was Not adapted. A false moat at all. <laughs> and uh, all the things that you had to endure childbirth, deprivation of food, essentials, light, um, raising a child, and all of these complicated emotions and backstory to it, and yet. Everything just made such beautiful sense. Um, how did you even attempt to tackle that? It, it just seems almost insurmountable. <laughs> yeah, we to, know me, it to me too. No, it did at first. Well, if, has anybody read the book? Oh, quite a lot of you. Oh, great. So for those who have read the book, you understand that Ma is, is not really a full concrete character with all of her complexities. She's... She's seen through the eyes of Jack. The story, the, the book is told through the eyes of this five-year-old. So Ma is just seen as almost like a god figure. And you don't really piece together, or he doesn't piece together a lot of the pain that's going on in room and, and the tortures that are happening, the darkness, this predator that's sort of coming in at night because she's done such a wonderful job of creating a space of fun and imagination. And I think she does that so that that becomes a world that she can go into herself as a way of an escape from what's actually happening. So once I initially started speaking with Lenny, the director about it, it became this incredible opportunity to create her. And it was equally exciting and terrifying at the same time because she could go in any which direction because there was so much that was left unknown. And so in order to really find her honestly, I first started by looking at who she was before um, and creating a story as to who she was growing up, up until 17 when we imagine that's the age-ish that's when she was kidnapped. Um, and I wrote three diaries. You see like little flashes of them when, when um, we're back home and looking through the, the yeah, when you're looking through the yearbook. And so I wrote one from when she was about 10 and one when she was 14 and one about like 15, 16. And it was my way of sort of diving into that the adolescent mind and the things that are so big and so all consuming about, uh, you know, eye contact with a crush and worrying about body, what your body looks like and wishing that your mom will let you get highlights and all of these things that at that time seem like, uh, like as big a deal as what's actually happening in room much later in her life. And, um, and thought a lot about, you know, she's a straight A student and that her parents were maybe this, this pillar for her that she really hung on to as, as that she was maybe one of the only people that she knew that had parents that were still together and that was a point of pride. And then from there, I just kind of got to, to break her due to the circumstances. So spoke with a trauma specialist about the effects of sexual abuse and what would happen to the mind and how it would organize itself being trapped in that space. And was, it was very interesting to learn that when you're in a, in a space like that where survival is the main, the main function of the brain, it shuts down certain awarenesses in order to survive, in order to cope. So we knew then that we wouldn't really experience the pains and the traumas until the second half of the movie when she was in a safe place. And then I had to speak with doctors and nutritionists about the effects of the skin and the hair and the nails and the teeth when you don't have a toothbrush, when you don't have a hairbrush, when you don't have shampoo. Um, and so I started mimicking those things myself. Stopped, I mean, I kept brushing my teeth. That would have, I don't think my boyfriend would have liked that very much. But uh, I stopped washing my face and stayed out of the sun and went on a very restrictive sort of pared down diet and worked with a trainer in order to gain muscle because I imagined 
going through a pregnancy and then carrying your child and um, having and then having a growing boy who needs a lot of physical activity and movement in order to to have nap time and have this sort of typical routine that she um, would have had some muscle and that's the only thing she has to defend herself so my goal is always how much can we say without saying a word how much backstory can we get just by looking at someone and not explaining through exposition and i felt if there was this sense that although she looks worn down and beaten but she has a little bit of 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 stock to her, of muscle, that you would immediately get the sense that this was not somebody who had given up due to the circumstances. And also you have this other complex aspect of working with a young child, Jack and Jacob, who was, of course was amazing. Um, but that in itself as, as a blessing must have been complicated because of your role I understand you became best friends. And best friends talk a lot and depend on each other, as I'm sure he, he did. And you must have had a really special role in terms of every scene is really you and Jack. Uh, so was that, uh, what kind of experience was that for you? It, it was, it was great. It was absolutely great. I mean, it meant taking on a lot on my end of really being in charge in some ways of him and of his performance because um, it, we realized very quickly day one that it was just too complicated to have everybody from every department talk to him. There are certain technical aspects of making a movie that you just can do when you're an adult, so you're very used to you know, the the gaffer saying, hey, watch out for your light, don't let that shadow hit you, and, and prop saying, remember, you picked up the cup on this line, and so you have to do that now every time for the rest of the day, and don't touch your hair, put it behind your ear, because that won't cut together, and then you have a director that's saying, well, maybe try it more like this, and maybe remember we want it to be like this, and try it like that, and it becomes this sort of like trying to do so much at once that that was me patting my head, but I can't, so I have too much, so it looked like I had a weird tick for a second, but that was me trying to do too much at once. Um, but I, when you've been doing it for kind of your whole life and you're an adult, it just, be, you can just do it. But for an eight-year-old, it's rather overwhelming to have ten different people come up to you and tell you all of these different things. So we created the system where everybody would go to Lenny, our director, and we could tell him all of the things that needed to be done. And then Lenny could sort of pull me aside and tell me, performance-wise, what it was that we were needing, continuity-wise, what it was that we were gonna stick to, and so I could be the one that was just there with him, and we would let the camera roll. We wouldn't get so formal as to doing a lot of takes. We would just kind of do maybe one long one, and I would be the one to just sort of sit there and keep eye contact with him and sort of keep him in the place, okay, and maybe don't touch your hair, and okay, and now remember, you were gonna pick up the cup at that point, and let's try it this way, and you could really yell at me, why don't you try it again? I know that you liked, you know, that yell was pretty big, but maybe you can do it again that's a little bit louder. And we became sort of coaches to one another in a way that was really fun. And what I enjoyed about it was it allowed my, the selflessness that Ma has to extend beyond the screen. And the thing that I've always struggled with as an actor is the fact that no matter how hard I try, it's my face on screen and it's my body. And I can't just like CGI myself out of it. Um, and so sometimes I think it creates um, an experience that's not what I'm looking for because instead you think, oh, this is Brie doing this performance that I'm enjoying instead of it being Ma as a character that exists in a realm outside of time and space. So finding a way of making the work an act of service and not one that had to do with me, it wasn't connected to me anymore. It became about just doing the work and making Jacob my main focus. And so any of my choices and performances or even just quite simply my coverage was always secondary. Jacob was first, Jacob was the focus. And if we got to me, then like, cool. And I loved the fact that I was an afterthought. I loved the fact that I was secondary and that it could just be about 
this boy, this like magical, beautiful boy, and we could do whatever we, we would all be working as best we could to try and make it a fun, comfortable, easy environment for him. Thank you. And he, and he was a hero. He was definitely a hero. Oh, and yeah. it's funny because this film reminds me a lot of ways, and I think we're gonna be fortunate enough to bring another voice uh, on the stage shortly to help us answer some of these things. But I, I think of these, this film as a myth and a fairy tale to some degree. And it seems like with all the other myths and fairy tales, they always kind of kill off the parents first and then the kid goes on a journey. And in this case, it's different. You're still here, it's great. <laughs> uh, we're very fortunate because with us tonight, we have the director of Room, Lenny Abramson. I'd like to bring Lenny to the stage. We missed our gag because the plan was, I was there for a couple of minutes, the plan was I was going to ask a question when you opened it to the floor. I was going to say, hey Brie, is it true that the director of this film is not only a genius but extremely handsome? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That is good. That's good. No one's asked that question, you know. Why are, pe why are people <laughs> laughing? I don't understand. Well, I'm glad you showed up just in time because we were getting to the point of like talking about uh, faces and how important they are in film, and yet, you know, how you want this to be uh, parallel to the book, and obviously the essence of the book. And this was an ad adaptation of a really internalized dialogue where it was in the first person. Um, so how did, how did you manage to, to adapt this, and, and what did the, uh, the novelist have to say about that? Well, she, she was part, you know, we were, we sort of were a team from very early on. So it was, there was never a, a sort of, you know, me, me pushing for the film stuff and her saying, no, 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 we mustn't lose X, Y, and Z from the novel because I sweated so hard over it. You know, we were very much trying to find a way of, of shifting this extraordinary story and its essence from one medium into another. So it's, it's a very, complicated process of translation. I mean, you're right, the, the key thing about the novel is that it's told in the voice of the little boy and that allows Emma to, the novelist, to kind of keep whatever she doesn't want the reader to have to deal with or think about or whatever she wants to keep away or however she wants to focus the story, she can do that. But, you know, when you turn a camera on something, it the world floods in and so the concern was I suppose how do you how do you give this story the inflection of a child's um, interior kind of world and at the same time not be overwhelmed by the bleakness of the situation when you're looking at it rather than protected from it or distanced from it by the kid's voice so I suppose it's just a lot of you know, a, a lot of thinking went into it. And in a way, you just have to realize, I suppose, that film does point of view very differently. I mean, it, I, as I said to Emma, you know, you, you have the words, but we have the faces. So you can, by just being on that little boy's face, as you kind of hear and gradually piece together the, the reality of, of, of this situation, as the film starts and moves through its first few minutes, I think the, the kind of those, that real pathos of that is so kind of apparent on the screen. And, and I think it was a question of, of all of us trusting that with a very small amount of voiceover and a kind of decision to keep the information flow channel through the boy and not, not really let the audience know much about anything that he didn't know about, that already you're sort of a long way towards making this the boy's story. I think that the advantage of it not being rigidly tied to the boy is that suddenly from from a novel which was very much him with Ma being a kind of you know glimpsed figure through his his story now you have a two-hander and it means that this amazing character that Brie brought to life is is equally weighted and that was so you know things shift and change and 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 certainly, I think this quality of, of, of the three-dimensional mother is something that we really gained in the film. 
Um, like many great films, when you, you look at these things, the audience can't imagine, I know this is true for me, anyone else but Brie playing mom and Jacob playing Jack. So when did, how did this happen, this collaboration here? Well, I was born October 1st, <laughs> 1989. <laughs> A lot of begging letters and, you know, <laughs> baskets of fruit and, you know. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, from my end, I had read the book maybe a year before there was a script, and I was I was given the book by my manager who was sitting over there, who was who is quite blunt with me, and was like, "It's a fantastic book. It's going to be a great character. You'll never get it. <laughs> it's going to be super competitive." And um, then from there, there was this this script that I was able to see that there was just so much complexity in it, held in it, all of the things that I saw in the book, which was, it was myth. I mean, the book to me was just all mythology and all taking the story that seemed like a true crime story we had seen in the news, but turning it into this this really universal story that we could all relate to about, about growing up. Um, and so I, I had hoped that in my meeting with, with Lenny, who was just a, a hypothetical figure in my head, that he had the same, the, saw the same thing as me. And I wasn't going to meet someone who's going to be like, no, this is going to be real grisly, sort of down and dirty, true crime story. We really want to get down to the meat of, <laughs> of kidnapping. And <laughs> I want to meet that guy. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's the other that's the evil version yeah, of you that's, <laughs> that's the insensitive <laughs> pessimistic you um, but what was supposed to be this very short sort of get to know your coffee meeting turned into this like very epic one um, that ended with us showing pictures of, of our dogs and then I was like I'm in I'm, and um, but he did something that was really smart which was after talking with people he didn't just allow everyone to sort of like talk talk about it to the point where it was convincing. Everyone had to audition. And I was very excited about it because I truly didn't know if I could do it. It's There's so many factors that are so unknown to this that I didn't know if I was the person who had enough depth to play it and I didn't want to get the job and ever have to question it. So part of the fun of an audition is I get to secretly audition the director and see if this is a working, positive, cr collaborative, creative relationship because the audition is not so much about coming in and being perfect as it is about me sort of presenting raw materials and, and we can both sort of look at maybe like as if it's a giant slab of marble and go, I think it could be like that, maybe, it, but oh well, maybe it's like this and that's okay. and. You know, it's just showing the raw material and seeing where it could go. And it seemed like after that two hour work session that that it was good. I mean, as Bree says, it's not about at that in working in that way. It's not about somebody coming in with this finished thing and you assessing it and deciding, hmm, yes, I'll buy that one. It's <laughs> it, it, it's. It's actually like filmmaking is a, just a big long conversation with a lot of people and you want to that you know it's like you want that conversation to be interesting to be stimulating to feel that the person that you're speaking with brings their own perspectives and challenges you and and Brie was confident enough actually not to come in and say I know exactly who this person is she also was like searching it out and and it just felt to me that this would be such an interesting collaboration. I had no doubts about Brie in terms of her capacity to go really deep. And I'd seen it in Short Term 12 and just in the conversations that we had. But just that kind of open, uh, very simple encounter of two people just talking about something, that felt to me like the most exciting part of it. And I just didn't want that conversation to be over. Uh, I wanted to have it the next day and think about what we'd said and then come back and develop that further. And, that's pretty much what we did through the process of the whole, through making the whole film, particularly because we shot in sequence, which allowed us to discover things as we went and adjust things further down the line. And, you know, that was an advantage that we had because I said, ooh, you know, we have this little boy, it's gonna be tough enough for him 
to to understand you know to move through this story uh as it is imagine if it's all chopped up and luckily the producers said oh that sounds like a very good reason and then we all got to reap the benefits of shooting in sequence and and it was very it was a brilliant uh, advantage that i think we all felt yeah it, it worked marvelously um, shall we open it up for questions from the audience? Oh, yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Do we have some mic runners here who are running up and down the aisles? Mic runner. Oh, I want to see. Yeah. Mic runner. It's coming oh. to a theater near you. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just want to say, great movie. Loved it. Um, Bree, you worked with um, other young actors, like in Short Term 12. Um, and I just think you have this very like motherly, compassionate, I think sometimes when you see actors young, um, working with younger people, it kind of comes off like condescending or you're playing down to them, but you just never got that. And I, um, I wanted to ask you just about, um, did working on like on Church Room 12 with other young actors kind of help out here and what's that process like? Um, there were some aspects of Short Term 12 that, that helped, mainly that it just solidified that I really love kids and I prefer working with them. Um, but I think where a lot of it came from was being the eldest grandkid. And um, I had, I have a younger sister and I had two cousins that um, since they were both babies, either lived in the same house as us or in the house right next door to us. And so I'm just, was always around kids and was always the designated babysitter and somehow became the ringleader of all of these crazy games and, and I've always had a very big imagination and it was, became the ringleader into all sorts of, you know, I would always wrangle the kids in the neighborhood to make movies and to, I would turn, you know, the new, the big screen TV box into an airplane and I would be the flight attendant and we'd spend all day doing that, forgetting that we had just got a new TV. Um, and so it's the sense of, that sense of play um, and it's one that I'm very interested in because I think it's so, and being around Jacob, you're reminded of it, it's, it's so delicious and so, um, everything is so fun and easy and there's a flow to everything and there's a lack of, of fear and you just sort of go through things without being so concerned about an outcome. It's so present and it's something that I think we get to enjoy up until a certain point and then hormones hit and it's kind of like, this massive tornado that just like demolishes the mandala and then you have to spend your entire life rebuilding that mandala and getting back to the kid. So I just wanted, once I kind of clocked that, I was like, oh, just get me back to the kid. I just want to be around them all the time because there's so much wisdom and, and making a movie is really, really hard. And so when you have that, that little sense of lightness and that reminder that's around you all the time it, it becomes very inspiring because they don't get taken down with it crying like a scene where you have to be really upset and cry i remember in short term 12 the um caitlin deaver who plays Jaden. i remembered having this uh, she has this this scene where she has this huge meltdown and i have to restrain her i have to hold her out down on the ground and she's spitting at me and cursing and crying and I remembered we did it three times and she just nailed it every time. It was just going out of her mind. I remember going up to the director going, I mean, can I just, this is a lot. Like, I would really slow down. Maybe we should be done with this or move on to another angle. And the director was like, well, let's just ask her. I was like, Caitlin, how do you feel about this? She was like, it's so fun. Let's keep doing it all day. And I was like, oh. That's the difference is, you know, for me as an adult, I was like, I was really bringing up my own issues. And for a kid, it's like, I can cry. Isn't that amazing? And it was the same thing with Room. I mean, Room was the first time Jacob cried on camera. And when it happened, he was like, yeah, it made everybody on set clap. It was like we had this huge, this huge moment of celebration. And so I think it reminds you again that instead of getting so stuck on like, the pain being the pain. The pain is actually this sort of like, oh, wow, I'm feeling pain. How cool is that that I'm getting this sort of experience? What's that like? I guess I'll just express that and I'll remember this. I can cry on cue now. I'm going to use this on my mom later. Like, this is pretty good. But it's true that, oh, I mean, you know, there is this kind of perception that it, it has to be, there has to be a certain kind of intensity 
in the doing, otherwise the thing isn't real. And actually, I think sometimes really good art is characterized by a certain lightness that you are, that that delicacy allows you to do really detailed and beautiful stuff without feeling that there's this sort of freight train of unrestrained emotion that has to like, you know, crush everything. And there is a cult in, in I think, contemporary drama of, of a kind of showy intensity in, in actors. And we, we celebrate that and we talk all the time about, you know, these incredible creatures that are, you know, and, and we, we, we hear about tantrums and we think that must be a sign of really great art. But as far as I'm aware, you know, Sebastian, Johann Sebastian Bach trotted every day to the church, was there on time, delivered his cantatas at the end of the week. <laughs> And I don't think he trashed any, you know, 18th century hotel rooms. Uh, and yet that work has kind of lasted, strangely enough. Which is that, you know, I, I have attempted that anecdote on, on a several actors who shall not be named. And let's just say it didn't go down very well. Other questions? I, my question is related to the child as well. How is a director do you choose and find a child that you think can handle this? I think you have a lot of luck is how you do it, you know, because it's incredibly difficult. Um, we, we looked at hundreds and hundreds of boys um, and I got lots on tape and, you know, most of the time there was absolutely no film there. You, look, you know, fantastic kids, real beautiful kids, but, but just not, you know, there would be nothing there. There would just be a pretending. And, uh, and there is every chance that we could have gone through a long casting process and not found a Jake. There were some other kids who, who were, you know, you would, have, you would have said, okay, I think we can, we're gonna go for it and we're gonna really try. But, but the seamlessness of his performance and the kind of, just the simplicity and the presence of him. So when I saw him on tape, he was actually quite, he was a little bit over, um, over kind of polished because he'd done some commercials and things. And I think what happens with those is that kids are encouraged to be really sweet and big and bright. And, you know, you really want to, you know, and that in a real film would come over as kind of psychotic. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're not advertising toothpaste or whatever, it doesn't, it is not really real. Um, but then when I went, <laughs> then, <laughs> then when I w met him, um, I discovered that he just, you could take that away immediately. He sort of got, when I talked to him about, well, you know, what are you really like when you're sitting in a room? Forget about the fact that you're, we're acting, you know, show me what it's like. Just, just like relax and show me what that's like and how long can you hold that? And suddenly you're looking at this beautiful face and you can start to read things into it, which is also how film works. It's not all projection, it's not all throwing out. A lot of it is inviting the attention of the viewer to supply all this extra stuff. But what, what was, Amazing with Jake is I think we, we all saw him, as, as Bree said, you know, he discovered the crying mechanism and we, we watched him develop as an actor from, through the shoot so that, and I, I was saying to somebody recently, you know, there was a point in Tiger Woods' life when he had never held a golf club, but as soon as somebody gave it to him and said, you know what, maybe just this is kind of roughly the stance and this is sort of how you hold your hands, then it's like, oh, 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 hang on a second, this is, I have all this equipment that works with this. So as soon as Jake was getting in touch with these muscles and this sense of timing and really, you know, for, through the first weeks of the shoot, you could just see him go, oh, oh, I have, this is, mm -hmm. yo, this is good. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, do we have another question? Hi, um, so the, the, the tragedy of this film is that, you know, it does happen in real life as we know. And I'm just wondering, um, how do you prepare the child to, to turn, I mean, does he get psychological training? And, and afterwards too, like, you know, what does this do to this eight-year-old boy? Like, I was just so curious. It's a very, it's a really good question. But I can say with absolute hand on heart, not the tiniest shadow passed over Jake in the doing of this. As far as he was concerned, we, we, we talked in terms of, you know, a storybook scenario that any kid would understand, namely that you've got a little house in the forest where there's a sort of, 
you know, a safe space and a lovely warmth. And then there's a big dark forest around that and there's some kind of monster in that forest. So, you know, he was no more scared of, of that, of the thing we were doing than he was reading the Gruffalo. You know, I mean, we never, he's totally oblivious to the kind of, to what old Nick's real motivation is. He just thinks he's a bad guy. And we, you know. He wasn't there. I mean, he didn't, the beauty of the story as well is that when it goes, when it, when it turns dark, when it becomes nighttime and it turns dark and the monster enters the room, Jack's in wardrobe. So um, even technically for shooting, he wasn't there. He never was, he never saw anything. There was a whole other level of the story that he didn't understand. And even if perhaps there was a moment where maybe someone talked about the bad man or um, I'm trying to think of a time when he would have even overheard anything. He, it's not in his vocabulary. These are not concepts that he even understands. So it's not even, I mean, there were certain things that we could very easily protect him from because he wasn't going to be there for. But then the other things, he just, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not in and his world. The other world. thing that, that's so, and, and it's a testament to the fact that the film works, that it feels really real, but a film set is the most artificial place that you could possibly imagine. So right now, you know, just, just after the call cut or before you call action, you know, there's somebody bringing in craft service and there's like people running around. And so it's very, very, it, it's, it's that the illusion is what happens, you know, when you put it all together. So yeah, I felt, I felt pretty good about it. And his parents were always there and, but I've never seen a happy, I mean, I genuinely never saw a happier kid. And, well, he thought it was the best and he would make fun of all of it all the time. He'd make fun of me all the time. I mean, like one of the scenes that I think is the most gut-wrenching is when we're reunited after the escape. And it's so memorable to me because, it, you know, there was just so much adrenaline that came out of my body as I was charging towards this car. And Lenny just said, try and find Jacob. And I didn't know which car he was gonna be in and I didn't know that the door was gonna be locked and there was just all this intensity. And I grab him and I'm holding him and I'm sobbing and, oh, you know, it was just the most intense feeling I'd ever felt in my life. And we all cut and he pushes off me and he's like, I mean, I just don't get it. <laughs> you just saw me 10 minutes ago. I don't know why you're so upset right now. And you just can't help but just laugh. And that's exactly, you know, that's, that's Jacob. <laughs> yeah. uh, for a second, I just want to take it back before you go to talk about children and parenthood and childhood uh, in, in context of the story. Because as terrible as the story is and as dark as the story is and how horrific <laughs> is, these things uh, are when they happen, and they do happen, this film is also allegorical, a metaphor, and the other element that I think that really is intrinsic to any great film is the universality of it. And this film has all that. Could you just speak to that sure. a little bit? Sure. Um, but I think what, what was, what's so interesting about the novel, and, 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 and by extension the film, is that Emma was thinking, well, what are the minimum, how, how much can you strip away and still have this childhood, still Still create, and, and what it really says is that with Mom manages to give Jake these two really crucial things, which is a sense of security and love. And with that, even using the really meager materials of this shed, he, he personifies these objects, he creates these stories, he constructs for himself a childhood. And for me, one of the things that comes out of the story is that we all obsess, any, I'm a parent, and I know all my friends who are parents obsess about whether they're doing a great job or not as parents, and obsess about whether the kid's learning the right musical instrument, or you know, all the extracurricular activities, and the, there's such an obsessive thing and about food and all those things, we all do that. But actually you realize the child themselves is this engine of optimism and creativity and, 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 and that for me is a beautiful thing to take out of it. I think the other, the other thing is that it's about the fact that at a deeper sort of allegorical level that 
we're all the time as parents in the business of creating a kind, a sort of bubble around our children. We talk to them in a different way. We talk to our partner and say, I don't know what the fuck we're going to do. You know, sort of, no, it's absolutely fine. Don't worry. We know exactly where we're going. You know, so you're constantly in this two, two, two speed world with our children. And, and at, at a very deep level, that's true about death and all of the things that we try to filter for our children to, to create a, to not burst the bubble. But the point is it always does seep in and growing up is a process of having that dismantled and coming face to face with the complexities and the, and the darker things of adulthood as well as the opportunities of adulthood. And this is like a, an intensified thought experiment which, which captures that and, 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 and it also does something it, which it says that the parent kind of can save the child but the child also saves the parent and you know I, I think there are, there are so many aspects of this film which, which are about all our lives and that's why I think it's moving you know and had we focused on the kidnapping part or the then it would have been we would have been accepting the terms of the captor and instead we tell the story in the terms of the survivor, and that is what I think is remarkable about it. Great, is there any comments you want to make regarding that? Oh. Lenny said so many wonderful things. I mean, this story for me initially grabbed me because it, it was the stories of my childhood. It is the story of Rapunzel, it is the story of Bluebeard. It, and then as I got older, I, I loved mythology, and it's Demeter and Persephone, and and it's the Plato's cave allegory. It's all these just beautiful, rich stories. And what initially always draws me into a story is the universal nature of it, because I believe in this experience. I believe in the theater as being a very sacred space. And your individual experience in the two hours that you spent sitting here is, is one that I want to continue to respect because something very magical happens when you could come here with 20 of your friends, but the lights go dim, this huge image comes on that's bigger than you and louder than you, and you're alone, and you become one with it. The participation mystique occurs, and you are allowed to go on what I think is a very, um, a very accessible shamanic initiation ceremony where we can go through and, and explore ourselves in a very safe way. It's, we're so safe here in this space and it can take us through all of these different ways and it takes us through the story of our lives, the story of the lives that came before us, our hopes and dreams for the future, the stories of our children's lives. And then when the lights come up, you're back in your body and you've been kind of around the world and back and you can take from it what you want. You might be changed from it. And then it's your job as you're walking home to sort through what it is from that experience that you want to take and what from your past you'd like to leave behind. And um, I think that this movie in particular, after having so many conversations and, and talking with so many people about it, everyone seems to feel so clearly about what the movie is and everybody so clearly has a different idea. That's, that is beautiful. <laughs>